It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. No, I'm not crazy. The reason I'm telling you this first is because some of the things I'm about to tell you, you're not going to believe. First, I see ghosts. Real ghosts. They look like you and me sometimes. They're paper white. Well, sometimes they're a baby blue color. There are even the misty black ones, and those I try to steer clear of. They are bad news. To those of you who have seen ghosts, good for you. Well, unless one of the ghosts you know used to be a child napper. That was my first one. The weeping woman, La Lorona. Don't ask how I survived, because honestly, as a kid, well... You're told when bad things happen to blink three times and they all just go away. And that's what I did. And amazingly, it worked. After that, there were a lot of the black shadows and a few blue ones. One of them happened to be a little boy. No more than five or six years old. Sometimes I wonder how he died. But unfortunately, I can't talk to them. I mean... They're dead. What do you expect? I'm no ghost whisperer. Anyway, I'm getting off topic now. Oh, number two. Mannequins are alive. Not in the traditional sense of, well, breathing, but more like robots or automatons. I completely believe one day, when their numbers are high enough, or they collect a hive mind... They will kill all of mankind. I've personally been attacked by these things on a few occasions. Maybe not all of them have some form of consciousness, but the vast majority of them are able to attack small groups of people. Those people who disappear in the malls, that is their doing. Number three. <laughs> this one really takes the cake. Stuffed animals can influence you into killing people. Now, I don't know if mine was just possessed by an evil spirit or what, but when he told me to kill people in my elementary school just because I had a bad day, well, let's just say I didn't sleep with that animal for a while. No, I won't tell you which one it was. I don't want to ruin any of your childhoods. Also, before you ask... Nope, I'm not a murderer. Just because I experienced it doesn't mean I actually killed anyone. So, like I said, I'm not crazy. I have stories to back up most of my beliefs and rational fears. And now that I'm here typing all this up, I'm not even sure where to start. Maybe one of my childhood stories. <laughs> Guess that's as good a place as any to tell you out how this all came to be, how I ended up being cursed by some sort of demon, well, probably. I was about ten years old, and no, I wasn't a horror movie buff at the time. I am now, but that's because I've become desensitized to it. Fifth grade year for me was when it all started, when I started getting strep every other week. Sorry I can't tell you where I used to live. I don't want anyone to recognize me. So, for this reason, I'm going to change the name of the teachers I had those years, as well as the name of my best and only friend. So, fifth grade year. My sisters and I decided to have a camp out in our room. The youngest of my sisters slept in the bunk bed, while myself and my other young sister set up blankets around the nightlight. Best a few kids could do, living in the mountains, where you had to worry about bears and mountain lions getting into your yard. Now, this was the night I met her, La Lorona. My father claims it was just a dream. What are they called here? Oh, night terrors. 
I'm not sure what possessed me to wake up at the witching hour. For those of you who don't know, that's the time where the spirits are closest to this realm. For me, this time was around midnight, about nine minutes from when I'm writing this now. When I opened my eyes, I couldn't move. Ghostly arm leading to a hand covering my mouth, and the other end led to her. Her hair flowing like she was lying in water. That scar over her right eye, if I remember correctly. I could only stare at her, watch her as she held up a finger to her lips. I tried to scream, hoping to wake anyone in the house, only to find I couldn't do that either. Now, when presented with these details, what would you have done? I was still an innocent kid. Well, aside from my stuffed animal asking me to kill the other kids a few years prior. I did the only thing that would have made sense to my childlike mind. I decided to blink three times. I honestly didn't believe it would work, but, well, it was better than just lying there not knowing what was going to happen next. Luckily for me, it worked, and I got up, running into my grandparents' room. I spent the remainder of the night with them. Now, if memory serves, my computer teacher, a crazy woman who always called me a troublemaker, even though we both knew better, well, I'll call her Josephine. She occasionally read stories to the classes. About a week after that incident, she told us the story of La Rochrona, and that's how I knew who she was. Now you can understand why I am how I am, why I believe what I do. Knowing this, would you believe me if I told you that this isn't where it ends? After that visit from the terrestrial plane of existence, I turned to horror. I started watching Goosebumps, or The Haunting by R. L. Stein. He was where I learned about the darker parts of the horror community. Watching a few of Stephen King's works later in my life, I then started watching The Ring, The Grudge, and a few others. A few years ago, I started getting into Creepypasta, <laughs> Laughing Jack, Jeff the Killer, Slender Man, just to name a few. You all know what I mean. You're part of the community as well, after all. So, when I tell you what happened after I moved to where I am now, well, let's just say I warned you. Now, I don't work there any longer. I've moved on and been working this new job for a week or so. It's quiet for now, but I don't think it's over. I used to work at a gas station. Now, I know it's overused and overdone, and yet for me, this is where it all began. The dark shadows that are following me are coming from that store. I met that little boy at that store, and I think he might be hunted by the dark shadow as well. Learning to work with those black shadows, hiding behind every shelf, was difficult. Even seeing them stand not three feet away from a few of my customers. How they didn't see them, I will never know. Some days I see just one. Other days I see five or six. About the time I started seeing more of them is when I became aware that they were after me. No. I don't know what I did to get their attention. Maybe it's because well, I know that they exist. Seeing the tall, shadow-like figures every ten minutes when I wasn't blocking them out. Now, I'm starting to wonder if there's a way to see what they want from me. I've been thinking about getting one of those spirit boards and going off into the woods so that they're not in my house. I'm not stupid enough to get spirits trapped in my house. and It's not like I haven't tried to get their attention. I've tried that Charlie Charlie game and a few others. No results as far as that goes, sadly. I also haven't tried talking to them directly. Don't need to be talking to what looks like air to everyone else. Well, not in public. 
Do they stick around long enough to answer yes or no questions in my home instead of disappearing before I can turn to face them? Then I would happily do that. Though that would need to wait until I have salt. So I can do those salt circles to prevent evil from taking over my body. I don't think that works as well in practice as it would in theory, though. I know they are watching me as I type all of this up. So I need to give all of you a warning about the shadow people. Shadow ghosts? If you see them, just act like you don't. You can't get rid of them once you've let them know you can see them as well. I'm going to do some research into ways to communicate with them for now. I'll get back to you if I find anything out, or if something else happens with other supernatural beings that I know about. For now, I'm going to have to sign off. Hopefully it won't take too long to get some much needed answers. So, Shadow Ghosts, the theme of our first story there. Now, is everybody warm enough? Come on, we're all friends here. Snuggle up a bit closer to the fire? That's right. Okay, ready for another one? Alright, the theme of this story is things that go bump in the night. I am the thing that goes bump in the night. I spent my first few centuries in seclusion. Sure, being worshipped as a god was fun for a while, but those petty mortals have no idea what it's like to live forever. I've had at least ten generations come and go while I keep living. The torture of getting married and watching your partner wither and grow old while you live in eternal youth, unaffected by disease, unable to simply end it all. Oh, it's enough to drive a person mad. I was there during the Black Plague as well. They had me dispose of those that had fallen to this brutally painful disease. I did catch the plague once or twice and it was agony, but, alas, it could not kill me, so I was to live with the pain of my body trying to rid itself of this putrid infliction. Then there was the London fire. I was there for that as well. I don't know what happened with that, though. I just snapped. I'd had enough of the pious morons worshipping the very ground I walk on, so they just had to be cleansed. As the years dragged on, I stopped living and simply endured my existence. I grew shallow and cold, hardened like stone by my lifetime of enduring mental and physical pain without being able to escape. It's really too much to deal with, and now... The only way I can really entertain myself is by traveling to different locations, making up some sort of bizarre urban legend, and then making it come true. Nothing pleases me more now than inflicting upon others the same agonizing torment that I've had to endure for years. So, let this be a warning to those of you who wonder what it would be like to be immortal. It is a sad, dark, and lonely existence, and it's just not worth it. Furthermore, if you should happen upon some local urban legends, it could well be that I'm not far from your home. In fact, I could very well be in your home, waiting to snatch you from the darkness. Out of everything I've spoken of, however, there is one thing that you can most definitely be certain of. I am the thing that goes bump in the night. Well, that one was short, but not particularly sweet. As is the next story I've got lined up for you this evening. How are you all doing? Anybody need some hot cocoa? A beer? Nice cold beer around the fire? Okay, here you go. 
All right. Everyone settled in. Right. Next story is about things we find under our pillow. I'm about to tell you my situation. And I'm going to have to ask you one thing. To believe me. Please. I know I'm not crazy. And I don't have any mental health issues. I'm a typical, normal guy. Going through something he doesn't quite understand. I need your help understanding it. Sometimes at night, I swear, I hear people talking. As soon as I put my ear to my pillow, it's like a whole group of people are chatting from within it. I'm not sure what most of them are saying, it just comes off as gibberish or nonsense to me. Sometimes I think I even hear scathing laughter amidst all the crazy banter within. I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm beginning to get a little nervous. I haven't tried breaking into the conversations at all. I wouldn't know what to say, as I'm not even sure what they're really talking about. It's almost like hearing a room full of people downstairs, coming through an open vent. It's not, though. I check my ceiling vent, as well as the one under my bed, and there's no sound coming from there at all. Complete silence, well, outside of my pillows. Last night, things changed a little bit. You see, this has only been happening for a couple of weeks. However, things have already seemingly taken a turn in a mysterious direction. I just changed into some shorts and a tank top for bed and hopped under the covers for the night when I started hearing a voice. Quite different from the ones from the previous nights. Hey you, come to bed. The very strange, whispery voice emanated from the direction of my headboard. It sounded hushed, but discernible enough to make out words among the short, round breaths. I stopped, not quite sure if I'd imagined the voice or not. Who's there? I asked, backing up toward my bedroom door. Come to bed. Come to bed and put your ear to your pillow. My heart was pounding, confused about what was transpiring. I walked slowly toward my bed and put one leg up on my mattress. I waited a moment to see if I heard the voice again. I was scared but skeptical. I decided to just do as the voice demanded of me anyway. I laid down and put my ear to my pillow and waited to hear what it had to say. Dream well tonight, please, the voice said. What the... I shouted and lifted my head and body up from the bed. I was arched on all fours, staring at my pillowcase. This couldn't be real. No way. Somehow... I found the courage to sleep in my bed last night. All I could hear was the usual gibberish, jumbled voices talking after that. I tried swapping my top and bottom pillows around to see if anything changed. I was greeted by the same muffled chit-chat, though. Has anyone else experienced this? Am I in danger? I don't know if I should just try sleeping on my couch or on the floor with a backpack under my head instead tonight. I do know that I had, well, wonderful dreams last night. Maybe I should sleep in my own bed again and try talking more with the voice that beckoned me to lie down. Everyone keeping warm enough? I hope so. Well, let's stick a few more logs of wood on the fire just to keep it going couple more stories to go after all. The next one up, the importance of listening to your grandmother. My grandmother had always been a superstitious person. She was ancient and was always going on about some urban legend or certain things you were not to do in a specific manner. We would speak of things like skinwalkers, 
haunting spirits or hook-handed hitchhikers. <laughs> but of course, I never believed her. And now, well, I really wish I had heeded her words. It was making out to be a dark but clear evening. There wasn't a cloud or star to be seen, and it nearly sent shivers down my spine. My family had all gathered at my mother's house for the holidays. While a few decided to leave, I was stuck staying here. My gaze led me across the room to my great-grandmother Myrtle, who seemed to be dozing in her chair. Checking my watch, I realized it was later than I thought, and I decided to go up to bed. I crossed the room and gently placed a large knit blanket over Grandma. As I turned away, I nearly jumped out of my skin as a bony hand clamped down on my forearm. I turned to face her, and she looked wide awake now. I looked at her expectantly, waiting for her to say something to break the chilling silence. Her eyes widened, and she seemed to be looking right through me, into my very soul. Don't you know? You're never to look out a window when the moon is full and the clock strikes twelve, she said, barely loosening her grip on my arm. Well, I didn't know what else to do, so I weakly nodded my head and gently pried myself from her deathly grasp. I made my way up the creaky stairs and soon snuggled myself into the guest bed. I lay there, awake, thinking about the chilling words of my grandmother. My curiosity was starting to consume me, so I decided that one little peek out of the window couldn't hurt. I checked my watch as I sat up to look out of the window. It read 11.59pm as I drew the curtains back as quietly as I could. I waited until the clock struck 12, and I concentrated my gaze on everything outside of the window. I waited for what seemed like hours, expecting some sort of boogeyman to pop up out of the bushes. After seeing nothing, I shook my head and buried myself back into bed. I hadn't even closed my eyes for ten seconds when I heard it. It sounded like someone was flinging small pebbles at my window. I rolled over, thinking it was some idiot teenagers trying to play some sort of joke but the small pebble-like sounds began to escalate into a furious pounding on my window. Oh, bastards, I muttered, as I found myself climbing out from under the covers and making my way back to the window. I angrily drew the curtains back, expecting to see some stupid kid. My blood froze, when what met me on the other side was not some reckless teenager. It was tall taller than any sort of person I'd ever seen in my life. Its skin was the same shade of copy paper, and was stretched tightly over its bony, emaciated frame. Dirty, matted hair lay in patches on its skull, and it was wearing a filthy, tattered dress that hung loosely over its sickly body. But the worst part were its eyes, or what was left of them anyway deep, soulless black sockets that seemed to go on forever. Despite its lack of eyes, I knew that it was staring right at me. If you've ever read the scary stories to tell in the dark book as a child, you may remember the nightmare-inducing illustrations. I felt like I was looking at a creature from a page in that book. Resorting to childhood behavior, I jumped back into bed and pulled the covers over my head, hoping I'd just imagined it and it would all go away. But I began to realize my worst fears as I heard the sound of the front door forcefully open. And here I am, writing this. I managed to wriggle myself under the bed and wait for my death. I can hear it stepping around the house, looking for me. Its steps are slow, but I know it will find me eventually. My message to you is, if 
if you have a grandmother anything like mine, or some person like that in your area, then listen to them. No matter how crazy they seem, they know. They know that you shouldn't make the mistake of looking out the window at midnight during a full moon. Take this warning. No matter how curious you are, do not take the risk. I know it's coming for me. In fact, the bedroom door just creaked open. Should always listen to your grandparents. Mark my words. Well, I see a few of you nodding off at the back there. That's okay. You can sleep. Okay, for the rest of you still awake, how about another story? This time, the importance of not always trusting what you see on the evening news. My work friends and I were at our favourite pub last night. Not really a fancy place, but, you know, cheap beer and close enough to home that I don't have to drive. The night started out normally enough. The four of us crammed into a small table off in the corner, mostly talking shop and shitting on our boss. Being this was the middle of the week, there weren't too many other people around, maybe around eight or nine others in the whole place. Everybody just kind of keeping to themselves. You know, the sort of people you'd expect to see in a pub on a Wednesday. Anyway, from where I'm sitting, I have a pretty good view of the TV behind the bar. Jesse, the bartender, is kind of lazily flipping through channels and passes by our local news channel. There's a brief burst of orange and red on the screen, which I register as a fire happening somewhere, which then disappears as Jesse switches over to the next channel. Something about the image looks oddly familiar, though. Hey, Jess, can you switch that back? I call out to her. The news comes back on, and suddenly I recognize the building in the frame. It's my building, and it's burning. Holy shit, I say, loudly enough that a few people follow my gaze to the television. That's my apartment! The crowd in the bar falls kind of quiet. Everybody's staring up at the screen now. The screen shows a wide shot of the outside of my building. The camera must be set up on the north end of the block because I recognize a lot of shops on the ground floor. Property management, dry cleaner, convenience mart, and so on. The top left corner of the building is a flame. It's not a huge fire by any means, but it looks like a few units between the top four floors or so have already been engulfed by the flames. Jesus, man, one of my co-workers says. That, oh, gee, that sucks. There's an uncomfortable murmur of agreement that passes around the table. I mean, I don't blame them. I wouldn't know what to say in this situation either. Yep, I agree, just as awkwardly. Thankfully, my apartment is only about halfway up and located on the west side of the building. I cross my fingers, hoping my staff will be okay. The camera cuts to a reporter on the scene. He's standing a little further away. Looking at the shops in the background, I can tell he's across the street on the northwest corner of the building. Firefighters are expected on the scene at any moment, he's saying and hopefully they'll be able to contain this horrible inferno before it spreads any further. As I was saying before, it's very fortunate that everyone was able to evacuate the building before things got too bad, or who knows what tragic events may have unfolded. He's laying it on thick, my other co-workers joke. I chuckle a bit. All things considered, at the moment, it didn't really seem all that bad. But then, a few moments later, um, hang on, the reporter on TV says. We're getting some updated information. It seems... Uh, hang on one moment, while we readjust the camera. The previously locked down camera starts to shift, the angle focusing on an area of the building about halfway up to the west side. All the lights in the building are out except one. I feel a weird, creeping sensation as I start counting the windows from the bottom. Five up, two over. 
That's my place. I swore I'd turn that light out, I think at first. And then I see it. There's a person standing in my window. The camera is zoomed out too far to make out any features, but it definitely looks like a man. And it's definitely standing in my apartment. I watch, petrified, as the camera zooms in closer. The reporter babbling on about the overlooked, ill-fated soul still trapped in the blazing... As the image gets closer, I start to make out more details. The person is... dancing, or something. I don't really know how to describe it, but he's moving around a lot, and everything he's doing has this bizarre rhythmic quality to it. He starts waving his arms in the air, back and forth, back and forth, and then he's waving them up and down at his sides. Then he's banging both fists on the glass. Then he's waving his arms over his head again, back and forth. Everything he's doing is to the exact same tempo. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. He starts jumping up and down, waving his arms over his head like he's trying to get someone's attention from a long distance. But everything is to the exact same rhythm over and over again. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. What in the f- I say, my voice a hoarse whisper. And then the camera gets a little closer, and finally we can make out the person's features. It looks almost exactly like me. It's wearing the same exact clothes that I'm wearing now. Clothes I changed into moments before leaving the apartment earlier. Its face looks almost exactly like mine as well, except for its eyes. Its eyes are far too big for a normal person. It also has this almost comical look of horror on its face. I don't even know how to describe it. Imagine if someone were pretending to look scared, but as a joke. It would have almost seemed funny if the circumstances were different, but instead, it was just extremely unnerving. No one in the bar is talking there. Everyone is fixed on the TV. The person is still swaying and waving around, beating its hands on the glass or jumping in circles. I almost don't hear the reporter mention the fact that firefighters have rushed into the building and are now heading for my floor. Oh, God, I think, without really understanding what was happening. Please, don't go in there. I stare, transfixed at the screen. From this angle, you can just barely see the top of my front door through the window not too far behind where this creature is flailing around. Right now, it's holding its face in its hands and shaking its head from side to side as if saying no. Suddenly, the door behind it bursts open as, presumably, the firefighters have entered my apartment. The creature stops moving. For a second, I see its expression change. The comical look of horror is gone, replaced by a huge smile filled with enormous pointed teeth. Then the lights go out. We all just sat there, staring at the screen as the camera slowly zoomed out from the now dark window. No one says anything as we all quietly pay our bill and leave. I went directly to my sister's place across town and asked to stay with her. I told her there was a fire at my apartment, and, well, that's it. When I tried to find footage from the news online later that night, it seemed like they'd edited that last part out. Oh, I don't know if any of you know what that thing was, but I hope they didn't put out that fire. I hope they just let the whole fucking place burn to the ground. Ah, another
a fine story, that one. How are you all doing out there? Doing okay? Everybody got their favorite drink? Let me check. Hey, you at the back. Come on. Come and grab a cold beer if you want. We're all friends here. Marshmallows, anyone? Been roasting some on the fire. I see a few more of you have nodded off. That's fine by me. You just sit back and relax, okay? Next up, we have a story on the importance of keeping an eye on the prize. This tale is called An Astute Observation. A camera flashed. The light highlighted the gruesome scene. A woman murdered in a bathtub, lying in a pool of her own blood. Yet, the investigator was looking at her nails. The only other one in the room, the officer standing by the bathroom door, thought this was interesting. He asked, with a smirk, why the investigator was focused on her nails. If there was a scuffle, the investigator said quickly, then sometimes they can take the blood, the flesh, of their assailants under the nails, when they scratch and claw. He examined the woman's other hand. Sometimes you can see if they've had a pedicure recently. Professional sounds silly, but it means someone has seen them lately. Gives us a time frame. Have they been trimmed recently? If her nails are polished freshly, suggests she wasn't missing long. If they're chipped, faded, and it could suggest longer captivity. We don't have an ID yet, and these things can be critical. He looked at her wrists, bound to the bathtub's faucet. He sighed disappointedly. He had found nothing. This is obvious, he said, pointing along the rope bindings. We can see that. It's been noted. Hemp cord. Could have been purchased anywhere. Doesn't give us a time frame. Doesn't give us an ID. Gives us nothing. The forensic investigator stood up, letting his camera rest on his chest. You have to be observant, he told the young officer. Notice the little things. Astute observations. That's what matters. The officer nodded as the investigator gestured to the body. What do you see? The officer took a deep breath. Something pretty nasty, he said in all earnest. Certainly, the investigator said, exasperated. What else? More specifically, point out the obvious. The officer leaned forward. She's... Uh, she's been bound. Hands to the faucet, yes. Legs together, her ankles. Look closer. See the bruising? The officer leaned in a little closer, looking to the places where the officer pointed. The skin was blackened. Yes, he said uncomfortably. The ropes aren't tight enough to cut off circulation. She had room to struggle. The bruises she caused on her own. What else is obvious? The victim is... is in a state of undress. Why are you asking it like it's a question? The investigator scolded. Not important. Don't blush over it. She's dead. She doesn't care. If she did... He leaned in to whisper. She'd be more concerned about the being dead part. The investigator pointed back at the woman's chest. Look at the wounds, not her tits. Describe them. Um, the officer started, flustered. Deep, circular, bloody. You're searching for words, he said. You found some of the right ones, but the correct word is ragged. Look at the edges of her skin. The officer thought he'd rather not. It's jagged, almost like it's torn and not sliced. Jagged blade. A saw. They sawed her. Why? The officer asked. Well, you ever try and cut through ribs with a straight blade? It takes too long. Tedious. They cut through bone. They needed a saw. See? The crux of her sternum? That's the largest opening. Where she struggled the most. Yeah, that's the entry wound. Looks like they marked her, the officer said. Yes. The investigator confirmed. That's the smartest thing you've pointed out so far. It means this was, more than likely, a ritualistic killing. Ritualistic? The officer asked. Cultists. Although, don't quote me yet. There may only have been one. 
The officer couldn't believe it. That's mad, he said. I've seen a lot of mad, the older man chortled. <laughs> you get used to it. Two arcs, three central punctures leading down to the sternum. The investigator pointed to all of them. See how the punctures are clean? The investigator pointed out. Both in execution and splatter. They happened later, long after she was dead. But that wasn't all. Cuts on her arms and legs. Look small, don't they? Insignificant. One on each arm, one on each leg. And don't forget the two punches on the neck. Do you know what they cut? And the officer guessed. She's laying in a pool of her own blood. Does that mean they cut the arteries? Exactly. The common carotids, the brachial, and the femoral. They bled her. The officer gulped. Then they killed her. The investigator nodded. Probably a little bit after they cut her. Easier to let someone bleed if the heart is still beating to do most of the work for you. The young officer felt disgusted. But the investigator continued. There's more. More that you're not seeing. All he could focus on was the pool of blood. How much blood's in the human body? He asked. Four to five liters, give or take. The investigator murmured, pulling out a vial, meaning just enough to cover the bottom of the tub, and then some. This tub's about a quarter full. Does that mean... Yes, the investigator said, taking a sample of the blood. This isn't just the girl's blood. Jesus, he mumbled, turning away from the body. Another flash. Jesus has nothing to do with this the investigator said from behind his camera, leaning to change the angle. I've heard of satanic cults and human sacrifices before, the young officer started. Oh, I didn't think I'd ever. No, I wasn't satanic, the investigator interrupted. Looks pagan to me. I literally mean Jesus had nothing to do with this. How do you know? The officer inquired. The investigator just shrugged. Don't really, just a guess. The symbol is too alien. It's bizarre. Satanists typically don't even perform human sacrifices, believe it or not. It actually goes against their religion. Ain't that the shit. They kill animals, though. Lots of them. That's probably what all the excess blood is, anyways. Probably just blood they took from a goat, a dog, well, some other furry bastard. As the investigator chuckled, the officer leaned in closer. Something felt unusual. So, the investigator continued, unaware. If it makes you feel better, we're probably still dealing with only one human victim. We'll figure out for sure when we get back to the lab, though. Something looked unusual. Kind of makes you curious, though, doesn't it? What were they trying to summon? What sort of vile creature or entity or... You even listening to me, boy? Sir, the officer asked completely ignoring the man's question. Did someone open the drain? What? The blood, sir. It's, it's leaking out. The investigator knelt down beside the body, and the officer joined him, pointing to the edges of the tub. See? The officer asked, pointing to the edges of the tub's porcelain walls. They're stain lines, see? Just a little ways above the actual blood level. The blood's draining. Oh, you actually noticed something. The investigator laughed. <laughs> Good on you. Good on you, indeed. The investigator held out his gloved finger and placed it against the inside of the tub right at the bloodline. Within seconds, the blood had fallen away from his finger. Oh, it's going out fast, the investigator stated. But what does it mean? The officer asked, confused. Has it been draining the whole time? Must have, the investigator said. Well, I didn't pull the plug in. Neither did anyone else. But, sir, if it had been draining that fast, then there never should have been a blood pool to begin with when we walked in. She's been here for at least an hour already. The investigator stopped and turned to the officer. He had a very, very good point. You're absolutely right, he said. Completely. So, what changed? Why is the blood leaving? The investigator reached his gloved hand into the liquid beneath the girl's head and felt about the drain cover. Hmm. Drain's closed, 
he said. Tightly. What the hell? Do you see any leaking around the edges there? The officer didn't respond. He didn't even look for the leaks. He'd noticed something even stranger. Sir, he said, cautiously, unsure if what he was about to say was foolish or not. Should she still be bleeding? The investigator looked over and across the woman's body, blood dripping from his gloved hand. No, he said, mouth agape. She... she shouldn't be. She is, the officer said, pointing at the wound on her chest. Look. Sure enough, blood still flowed across the woman's skin. Rivulets flowed across her chest, between her open wounds and the pool beneath her. But the investigator noticed something that the officer did not. Something small. Quickly, he got to his feet and calmly but decisively told the officer, We need to leave. Now. What? The officer asked, looking up. What's wrong? The investigator mouthed two simple words, barely audible under his breath. Look closer. So the officer turned, and he did just that. He looked at the flowing blood. It took him longer than it had taken the investigator, but once he saw it, he jumped to his feet. That's not possible, he said, panicked. That's not possible. Sir, what the hell is happening? Grabbing the officer around the shoulders, the investigator pushed him through the doorway. We're going, he ordered. Now. But how? The officer insisted. How is that even possible? It shouldn't be possible. Their bickering voices persisted down the hall, all the way outside. Meanwhile, in the bathroom, the blood continued to flow, but... Not in the way it should have. Draining from the tub, the blood followed a simple path. It crept upwards along the girl's chilled skin. It seeped inwards through the unholy wounds on her chest. It pumped by means unknown through her newly refilled veins. It coursed through her body, controlled by a sentience completely new to this world. The blood had drained completely. And her eyes opened. Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? Originally published in 1849, Edgar Allan Poe's prophetic question has stayed with humanity ever since. With scientists suggesting this may all be one large computer simulation, I find myself split between wondering if it really is true and we're all just living a dream, and hoping that that really is the case and that this isn't reality. Join me around the campfire, my dear friends, and don't be scared. Remember, it's only a story I'm going to tell you. The human brain is an odd thing. Your memories, mostly from your childhood, are vague and ambiguous. Is what you remember even real? Could it be that you've manufactured your childhood memories from the stories your parents tell you about yourself? Think about it for a second. Do you actually remember? For me, I don't think I do. Why? Well, my story, the story I am telling, will explain why. I have had this recurring dream since I was a child. Maybe around eight? I can't exactly recall when it started. The dream is, well, simple. I'm standing in the middle of the desert, alone, isolated from humanity. It's always daytime when I come here. I say, when I come here, 
because this is where I always am in my dream. It's really hot. There are beads of sweat trickling down my forehead. The sweat lingers for a minute to the tip of my nose and drops into the sand. It's so quiet that I can hear the sizzling sound of my sweat as it hits the scorching sand. I look down and I see that I'm standing there barefoot. Not just barefoot, completely nude. But the sand isn't burning me. I just stand there, in isolated silence for the entire dream. That is until the end. A giant wave, <laughs> yes, a giant wave, in the middle of the desert comes out of nowhere. I try to run from it, but I'm firmly planted into the ground and I can't move. The wave hits me with such force, I swear I can feel it. I can feel the water going into my nose, my mouth, my ears. And then, suddenly, darkness. I'm laying there. I don't know if I'm in my bed or if I'm somewhere else. There's a cloth of some sort covering my entire body. I think I'm dead, but I can hear my heart beating. Pump. A steady, healthy beat. I can feel the blood coursing through my veins, except I'm not breathing. I take one giant gulp of breath in and I wake up. It is the exact same every time. I know what to expect, when to expect it. But I can't control the dream. I know what you're thinking. Go and see a psychiatrist. You don't think I have? Of course I have. That's why I've been prescribed everything from sleeping pills to antidepressant medications. None have helped. And want to know something else that's odd? I don't dream. Except for that dream. Sometimes I don't think this dream is a dream. I think it's real. But I have to gather my composure and tell myself I'm just paranoid, right? I'm a single, 30-year-old woman with no husband, no kids. So yes, it is possible that I might be slightly depressed. But I can assure you that I'm not crazy. Something happened to me a year ago, and ever since then, I've never been the same. I was driving home from the grocery store when I fell asleep at the wheel. I don't know why, I don't know how. I just suddenly got extremely tired and couldn't keep my eyes open. I blacked out. When I opened my eyes, I was... <laughs> where else but the desert. The exact same desert I'd seen so many times in my dream. Except this time it was different. I was inside a tube filled with liquid, like a fetus. I freaked out and started touching my body to see if I was still an adult human. Thankfully I was. Not that it made me feel any better. I was in so much shock when I first opened my eyes that I didn't notice what was around me. I, floating in this glass jar filled with a mysterious liquid, could barely see what was out in the desert. But, as I squinted, I could not believe what I saw. I saw millions, if not billions, of tubes like the one I was in. There were people in them. Strangers. Small, medium, big. Female, male, young, old, 
people of all colours. I immediately got nauseous. I stuck my face to the glass to try to get a better look at these strangers, and all of their eyes were closed. They looked dead. I closed my eyes and kept repeating over and over again, This is not real. This is not real. This is not real. I probably said it a hundred times, but I still felt the liquid caressing my body. I started to cry, not that anyone or anything would have noticed. I frantically started punching the glass, but liquid makes the force of movement much slower. I had no success. It was then that I realized that there were wires sticking out of my head. Oh, God, they were inside my skull, attached to my brain, I would assume. I touched them gently and shuddered. Chills ran down my spine. I didn't know what to think. Can I rip these out? Will this kill me? Would it matter? I'm probably already dead. So I said, fuck it, and ripped the wires out of my skull. Damn, it hurt so bad. Crimson red filled my entire tube. I thought, this is when I die. Just accept it. So I floated there waiting for the darkness, but then suddenly I heard a noise. I looked around, but I didn't see anything. I looked up and I saw a glimmer of light shining through. That's when I realized that the latch closing the tube had opened itself at the top. I popped my bloody head out and there it was, that hot sun beating on my face. I had never been so happy to breathe in the air. That is, until I started choking on I was gasping and coughing, and gasping and coughing. It was like my lungs had never breathed air before. After a good two minutes of pain, my lungs started working again. I plunged out of the tube onto the hot sand. That sizzling sound filled my ears, except this time I could feel the heat. I could feel the hot sand against my skin. It felt like a freshly heated griddle against my body. Fuck it. Fuck it. Fuck it. This isn't real. This is a fucking dream. I'm dead. Just go. I got up. Burned. Bloody. And naked. I started running towards the closest tube. I didn't know who was in there, but I didn't care. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. I knocked on the glass, screaming and crying. Please, wake up. Nothing. I sat down on the sand in front of this stranger's tube. Hopeless. I put my face into my palms and started bawling. This is what my dreams had been warning me about. I'm going to die one day. I'm going to end up in my own hell. And this is it. Then, something came over me. I don't know what it was, but I looked up at the stranger in the tube, and I felt that this was not the end for me. I felt that there was something more to this place. Not that I'm special or anything, but that I was meant to come here. All those nights waking up, wondering what the hell this dream meant, had led me to this point. There must be a deeper meaning to this. I stood up, wiped the mixture of blood and tears from my face, and climbed onto the top of the tube. 
I started pulling at the latch as hard as I could, but it would not budge. Not one bit. I sighed, and as I was about to jump off, I saw this circular impression on the top of the tube. I touched it. Nothing. I pushed it, and it opened. It opened just enough for me to stick my arm through. What the hell? I stuck my arm in and swished around, trying to feel for the wires. The top of the tube is so black I couldn't see where my hand was going. I felt something, so I just grabbed it. I think it was the stranger's shoulders. As my skin touched his, I felt this surge of electromagnetic energy. My muscles started cramping up and I felt my entire body stiffen. I couldn't control my body, and my eyes began rolling into the back of my head. I heard a loud sound, an alarm-like sound. It went, and didn't stop. I wasn't able to take my hands off the stranger. I was stuck here. I began to freak out, and then I saw it. I knew his name. He lived in Moscow, Russia. I saw his life through his eyes. I knew his every thought, his every move. Things I didn't want to see, I saw. I started screaming, but no words came out. Just cries of despair. When the vision of his life finally stopped, I flew about a hundred feet and landed in the sand. The loud sound was still going. It was deafening. The life had just been drained out of me. I laid there, gasping for air, my mind racing a mile a minute. My muscles were still cramped and I could feel the air escaping my lungs. I started to come in and out of consciousness. I was groggy, but I heard inaudible sounds coming from around me. It sounded like people. Real humans. I felt relief for a brief moment, like it was going to be okay. I felt for them. There was definitely more than one. They grabbed me. They were carrying me. Thank God. They're taking me to get help. Then I felt my body get dunked back into the mysterious liquid. That's when I realized. No. I'm not going to be okay. Before I completely blacked out, I heard the latch above me close and lock. Pitch black. Next thing I remember, I woke up. And I saw one of my girlfriends, a strange man and two strange women standing there staring at me. I was so confused. My friend started tearing up, but I had no time for emotions. I was confused as fuck. She started whimpering. I, I can't believe it. You're a... I immediately cut her off. What? What? What are you talking about? I need to call the police. I need to talk to someone. Calm down. You're in good hands. Do you know where you are? The strange man came closer to me. That's when I saw the name tag. Doctor, I realized I was at the hospital. The hospital, I said reluctantly. As confused as I was, I was relieved. He smiled. Yes, you've been in a coma for two months. You were in a bad crash, but you're going to be okay. 
We're just glad to have you back with us. We almost lost you a couple of times. Your lungs collapsed, you had burns all over your body, and severe swelling in the brain. We thought there was a high possibility that you were going to be a vegetable for the rest of your life. But it looks like you'll be fine. I... Uh, thanks. I didn't know what to say. I just wanted to get home. Now, let's fill out the paperwork and get you out of here, the doctor said as he waited for the two nurses to follow him out of the room. My friend held my hand and asked, Promise me you'll take care of yourself. Yeah, I looked at her. Hey, uh, thanks for being here. Oh my god, of course. The others visited you too, but you weren't awake. I came on a good day. She smiled. I looked around my room. There were flowers, cards, chocolates and balloons everywhere. I'm not going to lie, it felt good to know that people still cared about me. I was relieved that I was okay, but more so that I was no longer in that tube, in the desert. Now, yes, this might be just another one of those, oh, I was in a coma, I saw some crazy shit, because my mind was tripping for two months, kind of story. I honestly laughed when I got home from the hospital. But there was just one thing. One little thing I've tried to explain away, but couldn't. It's always nudged at me. So recently, about a week ago, I went onto Facebook and searched for the stranger's name that I'd seen in the desert, keeping it anonymous for the sake of this person's privacy. I was pretty confident I wouldn't find anything, but there was a glimmer of doubt, so I wanted to be a hundred percent sure. As the browser loaded, I anxiously watched the screen. The results popped up. I didn't recognize any of the faces, <laughs> thank God. As I was about to exit the browser, I saw that there were two more profiles that I needed to scroll down to see. My hands shaking, I began to scroll. The first face, no. I felt slightly better. Now down to the last profile. No. So much relief. But wait. The face on that last profile. It looked familiar. It wasn't him, but I stared at it for a minute. I felt my stomach drop. I've seen this face. It's his kid. I clicked on the profile and quickly clicked through the pictures he had available to the public. And there they were. Pictures of that stranger's face, although he was no longer a stranger to me, I was to him. I kept clicking through. Yep, that's his wife. That's his house. That's the restaurant he always eats at on Fridays. Holy fuck. I slapped my laptop shut. <sighs> Denial. I'd been in denial for a year. That's why I'm writing this. I can't explain to you why it happened to me and not you. But it happened. Believe me. Don't believe me. I don't care. All I can say is that I have come to understand that my time in the desert was real. It wasn't a figment of my imagination, but a genuine experience. I don't know what I discovered, but what I believe is that the lives we are living right now are fabricated lies. 
The experiences we perceive as ours aren't ours at all. We're just one of billions of strangers trapped in a tube. Part of a bigger experiment. Something more mysterious than any of us could ever understand. Some people seem to have a gift, a second sight, as though they can see into the future and understand what's going to happen way before it actually transpires. Me, I'm not so sure. But then again, I'm not prepared to rule anything out. Now then, boys and girls, I've got a little story to tell you. And it begins right now. My little sister is 13 now. Her name is Zoe. She has blonde hair and blue eyes. And she likes pop music, fashion, and other typical teenage girl stuff. I really do love her. I must have been seven or eight when she first came home. I was excited to finally see my little sister. At first, I'd been annoyed that the baby was going to be a girl, as I'd wanted a little brother. But I was happy when she eventually did come home. This kind of disappeared quickly, though. It was about a week since Zoe had first come home. My dog, Rusty, just would not calm down. Whenever he was in the same room as Zoe, he just barked like mad at her. Eventually, as my parents were scared that he would hurt her, they got rid of him. They didn't even talk to me. I just came home one day, and he wasn't there. It was only when I asked about it that my mum just casually said, Oh, we got rid of Rusty. We were worried about Zoe. And then, she went right back to feeding Zoe. I was confused. Both of my parents had just abandoned my dog, my best friend, in some pound somewhere, and they didn't even bother talking to me. They weren't even sorry. This was when I first started to gain some disdain towards her. It wasn't her fault, of course. If we kept the dog, she probably would have loved him too. I just blamed her at the time. When she was one, I was kicked out of my room. We lived in a three-bedroom apartment, just on the outskirts of some big city. There was my room, where I kept all my stuff. My parents' room, which was where Zoe had slept in a cot in the corner. And the tiny guest room. My parents had decided that Zoe should have her own room. But instead of refurbishing the guest room for her, they kicked me out of my room and gave it to her. Any protest I had was quickly silenced, and I could only watch as my room, my one free area that I had any say in, was transformed. Sports posters were replaced with pictures of ducks and sheep. My bed was replaced with a pink wooden cot and everything else that made my room mine was changed. They didn't even give me my bed or my TV or anything. All of the things like that were either thrown away or became Zoe's. They refused to refurbish the guest room for me, and I was, instead, forced to make do with boring beige walls, an old metal single bed, and a single wooden dresser for my clothes. I did decorate it slightly, of course, with posters and other decorations I'd managed to scavenge, but it wasn't the same. My parents seemed more concerned with where any guests we had were going to sleep. This was the point where disdain turned to hatred. It seemed to me as if they'd just completely forgot about me in favour of her. Eventually, my parents decided that I was old enough to be responsible and look after Zoe while they went out. I think she was about three years old 
So, she was old enough to speak. I didn't really want to do it, but my parents wouldn't take no for an answer. They simply left, saying that they had some pre-made lunch for her in the fridge. <laughs> there wasn't one for me, so I had to make myself something. I couldn't be bothered with looking after her all day, as there was this TV show I really wanted to watch. So I just laid a blanket in the corner, put a few of her favourite toys in there, and said this to her. You need to stay on the blanket. Don't move off it, okay? If you do, Mum and Dad will be really mad. So you have to stay in here. Understand? She simply nodded her head in agreement and started playing with her toys. I was on the couch watching my show my eyes flicking to her when there was a commercial break or some other boring segment. At one point I was watching two of the characters on my show beating the tar out of each other, when I felt a tugging at my trouser leg. I turned to see it was Zoe. She looked up at me and then sighed. I'm hungry. I told you not to come off the blanket, I said, shooing her off. She just sat back down on the blanket. I looked back to my show. Oh, it was a boring bit again. The victorious character was monologuing over the unconscious body of the loser. Well, I couldn't just not feed her. Harsh feelings aside, I got up and walked to the kitchen. As I was opening the fridge to get her lunch, I heard her say something from the other room. Daddy won't come. I was confused, but not enough to stop me in my tracks. What did you say? I asked, carrying her lunch over to her. He won't come. Come where? Here. Back. I was quite unnerved by this, but I didn't think too much of it. About half an hour later, the phone rang. I didn't check the number, assuming it was my mum, but instead, a male voice that wasn't my dad's came through the receiver. Hello, is this Daniel and Zoe? The voice sounded serious, and kind of upset and disturbed. Uh, yeah, I'm Daniel. Who is this? The voice then proceeded to explain to me, nice and clearly that there had been a traffic accident. My mum was in a critical yet stable condition, but my dad was not so lucky. He'd survived the initial collision, but died on the way to hospital. The next few hours were a blur. I just switched off the TV and stared at the blank screen as I waited for my uncle Jared who was married to my dad's older sister, my Aunt Louise, to pick me and Zoe up. We spent the next few days at his house. My aunt was inconsolable. I was just dull. I didn't speak. I barely left the bedroom I was in. Zoe was too young to grasp the situation but they said she understood that Dad was gone. The only thing I was thinking of until Mum came out of hospital and we could go back home was what Zoe had said to me. It was as if she somehow knew what was going to happen. I didn't forget about it. It got to the point where it was unnerving to be in the same room as her. A similar incident didn't come until much later, however. A year to be exact. It was a nice, sunny day. We all went for a walk in the park, me somewhat reluctantly, as by this point I decorated my new room and I had a TV, which I had plugged a PS2 into. My mom held my sister's hand and I walked slightly behind hands buried in pockets and generally wishing to be home. It was all quiet, nobody really speaking, when Zoe pointed to an inconspicuous looking guy in a hoodie. All she said was, 
There's a bad man over there. My mum turned to look. A man in a grey sweatshirt stood by a fountain. He was staring at his feet, hands in his pockets. I looked too. Something about him did seem rather off, but I didn't think too much of it. It was later on, when we'd left the park and were in the car on the way home, that I remembered how she'd predicted Dad's death. I leaned over to her. Zoe, what did you say about the man in the park? The bad man. She turned to me, her face covered in chocolate from the chocolate bars Mum had given us. The man had a knife. He was sad about something. He wanted to change it. She then turned back to look out of the window. I was just frozen. He was sad about something. He wanted to change it. I wanted to ask my mum to call the police, but I knew she'd find it ridiculous. I just stared out of my window too. The next morning, I was up before anyone else. I saw the local newspaper had arrived, so I picked it up to put it on the coffee table for mum to read. As I did, I glanced at the front page headline and I dropped the paper and almost jumped back in horror. Family of five stabbed to death in home. Beneath it was a mugshot, a man in a grey sweatshirt. It was then that I realised Zoe had a talent. I stopped being distant and uncaring of her, and instead listened carefully to what she had to say about anything asking her about random things that we saw. I would write down everything I found particularly interesting in a notebook I kept in my room. There wasn't anything major. <laughs> she worked out when the goldfish was going to die, but that was the biggest thing. I eventually worked out she could only make predictions linked to deaths. When she was six, Something big happened. She was watching some little girl TV show, eating crisps, when the phone rang. She turned to my mum's boyfriend, David, as he picked up the phone. Oh no, she said. I was on the other side of the couch reading a comic book. I looked over to her, expecting that something had just happened on the show. But she was staring at David. What is it? I asked. Grandpa, she said, still looking. I froze. I could feel in my gut that this was another prediction. We watched David talk on the phone. Yes? Oh my God, really? Jesus, I'll tell Kathy. Okay goodbye. Then he hung up. He noticed that both of us were looking at him, and a sunken look came over him. Oh, jeez, kids. I have some bad news. I knew what he was going to tell us before he even said it. Grandpa had passed away in his sleep. Mum was sad. Zoe was sad. I tried to be sad about Grandpa, and I was. But I was just more amazed and creeped out at Zoe. How did she do it? That was the last prediction for a long time. I eventually forgot about it, just chalking it up to coincidence. Then, last week, I got a phone call. Checking the caller ID, I saw that it was Zoe. I hadn't spoken to her in about a month. So I was pretty happy to see her name on my phone. I took the call. Hi Zoe, how are you? Dan, are you there? I need to talk to you. Are you alone? My girlfriend was sitting next to me, watching TV. Hold on, I'll move, I said, standing up. My girlfriend looked at me. Who is it? It's my sister. 
I'll talk to her in the other room. She just shrugged and turned back to the TV. I closed the door to my bedroom behind me. I need you to listen to me. I got a terrible feeling as if something was going to happen. You and Megan should get out of your house. Go to a hotel or something. Just get out of there. I couldn't speak. Not only had she predicted something again, but she was aware of the seriousness of the situation. Meagerly, I managed to say, Okay, thank you. I hung up. Then I rushed back into the room where my girlfriend was sitting watching the TV. Megan, we need to leave. Why? What's wrong? My sister had another prediction. We could be in danger. I told her about the predictions. She never believed any of it, or chalked it up to mere coincidence. Are you kidding? I'm not going anywhere because your 13 year old sister thinks we should. I told you about the predictions. This is serious, I shouted. After an hour of bickering and arguing, she finally agreed to leave. We went to a nearby hotel, booked a room for one night, and went to sleep. The next morning I got a call from the neighbour. He said our house had been broken into, but nothing was taken. I told my girlfriend and she was utterly dumbfounded. How in the hell did she know? was all she said. We talked to the police, and I called my neighbour and told him to call the police if they returned. We stayed at the hotel again that night. When morning came round, I was woken by my phone ringing. It was the police. We went to the police station, and apparently Megan's mentally unstable ex-boyfriend had broken into our house with a knife. They arrested him when the neighbour called the police. It was obvious to all of us what he was going to do. My girlfriend didn't say a thing. She was just completely blown away by what my sister had done. Without her, I would probably be dead. I talked to my sister about it, and all she said was this one thing. I could see your bodies lying on the bed. You were next to Dad, Grandpa, and five other people I didn't know. I have never felt more haunted than I did after hearing her say that. Nobody else believes it. Even my girlfriend is still skeptical. But I know for sure that my sister has a gift. Well, take a look around you, my dear friends. See, quite a lot of you are asleep right now. Well, what a pleasure it is for me to put you into the land of the sleepies. <laughs> Glad to see some of you are still here. And it saddens me to say that this will be my last story for this evening. I hope you've enjoyed our little get-together around the campfire. An hour and a half of stories to help you ease into the night. Well, my dear friends, don't worry. We'll do this all again very, very soon. Well, on to that last story. My name is Paxton, and my experience occurred in Western Canada on October 24th, 2015. I won't go into too many details about myself. What is important is the story that I must share with you. I have to get it off my mind, off of my shoulders, because it has haunted me for far too long. I wake up in the middle of the night with cold sweats and trembling from terror. Consider this a catharsis. I used to think the world was simple, that things are as you see them, and that was that. Shit happens and there's nothing you can do about it. I never believed in strange things, and by that I mean the paranormal and supernatural. Now I don't know what to think. I don't know how to best describe my experience. I guess I could call it a paradigm shift. I am, or was, an urban explorer. 
I used to love going to abandoned places such as hospitals, apartment buildings, warehouses and so on. It was the sense of adventure and discovery of these derelict places that drew me to them. A friend of mine, I'll call him Joseph, found a rural place, an old farmhouse an hour out of town. It was an isolated site that you had to go out of your way to get to, but it was well worth it, he said. It was one of those places, you know, where the family was murdered by someone unknown, and now the place is forever haunted by vengeful ghosts. Also, it was a place where satanic rituals took place, and demonic spirits now haunt the area. Every town has these stories that are made up by kids to scare one another. The fact of the matter is, nobody truly knows what happened. What we do know is that the family vanished, as if they simply got up and left. All their belongings, their stuff, just left behind. That of course happened 30 years ago, and the place has stood silent ever since. October 24th was a wet and grey autumn day. Scattered showers soaked the highway. In order to get to the house, we had to drive off the pavement and onto a muddy dirt road, surrounded by rows and rows of trees which swayed in the wind. It was a two-story house with a peaked roof and a dormer attic. At one time, it would have been a peaceful and comfortable place for a family to live. Now, it was a dilapidated shell of its former self. The surrounding farm grounds concealed by trees. Nature had reclaimed the place for herself. Despite the condition, I was pleasantly surprised to see the lack of graffiti and damage usually left by teenagers. Just a few empty beer bottles left on the front deck of the house. The windows and front door were boarded up. The back door, however, was wide open. The boards were removed and tossed to the side. That was like that when I checked the place out last week, Joseph explained. We continued exploring the exterior property. There were a couple of sheds out back and an old beat-up corpse of a truck. In the field beyond the truck, I noticed a collection of white stones. Loads of them just scattered about on the ground. Hmm, I didn't notice that earlier, Joseph remarked, with an inquisitive look on his face. Looking at the stones carefully, they seemed to form a spiral pattern. Intrigued, we approached the stones. Now, I don't know if I imagined it or what, but I swore I could smell ozone. You know, the aroma of lightning. I crouched down and examined one of the stones, noticing something etched onto its surface. It was a symbol of some sort that I wasn't familiar with. It was like a triangle, only with the bottom line missing, and the ends of the other two with a squiggly circle and another with a T-shape. I looked at another stone, and it had the same etching on it. Huh, that's fucking bizarre. I wonder what all this is, Joseph said as he took a look. I shook my head, not knowing what to say. We approached the back of the house, flashlights at the ready, and we entered the house one at a time. We were greeted by what appeared to be the kitchen. It was cold inside the building. Cold and gloomy, as expected, of course. Besides our flashlight, only the diluted sunlight peeked through the boards covering the windows. There was a mess of debris scattered about on the floor. Pots and pans and plates and utensils. A large wooden dinner table covered in three decades worth of dust stood in the center of the kitchen. The fridge and sink were coated in rust. The paint was peeling off the walls. But besides the mess, just as outside, the place was free of vandalism. We next moved into the living room, which was rather large with rodent-infested couches and sofas. The coffee table was flipped onto its side, and with a television set with a screen that was caked in untold amounts of dust. The air had the distinct smell of mold and piss. Dusty old books and newspapers and magazines sat on the floor in stacks. 
Near the front entrance to the house was a set of stairs going up to the second floor. I approached the brick fireplace and shone the flashlight. There was what appeared to be a photograph. I picked it out of the confined space and blew the ancient dust and ash off it. It seemed to be a family photo. Only the face it had been scratched out on each person. This has to be the family, I muttered under my breath. What's that? Joseph asked as I handed it to him. Yikes, he said. He placed the photo onto the mantel. I shone the flashlight onto the walls and revealed the portraits. I assumed they were of the family, but just as with the photograph, the faces were scratched out. Upon further examination, I noticed that the faces were scratched out in a spiral fashion. I felt a snake slithering around my spine. I shuddered in response. What do you think happened to them? I asked. Nobody knows. They just upped and left, I guess. There was no sign of foul play or anything like that. Beyond that, I don't know, Joseph explained as he gazed at the pictures. Hey, where do you suppose that goes? Joseph pointed out as he directed the light to the end of the adjacent hallway. A door was slightly ajar. I gently nudged it open and a set of descending stairs led down into the basement. Well, Paxton, do you want to check out the basement first or the upstairs? Joseph asked with a crooked smile. <laughs> Let's go downstairs and get it over with. I joked. Little did I know, I had just made a huge mistake. Shining the light into the inky blackness, we were assaulted by a powerful smell of mold. It was even worse now. The steps creaked under my footsteps, and as I hit the fourth step, there was a loud cracking sound, and the step gave out beneath me. For a fraction of a second, I was suspended in mid-air, and for that fraction of a second, I knew that I had fucked up big time. I just had enough time to open my mouth and scream. Part of the staircase joined my descent into the dark basement. I fell into tepid water that was several inches thick. My feet made contact with the hard cement floor, and my right ankle was twisted. Boards fell on top of my head as I slumped face first into the water. My screams were strangled by the nasty, bitter tasting water. I jerked my head out of the disgusting murky liquid into the darkness. I gagged and choked, spitting out the stagnant fluids, crying out in complete shock. I tried to stand up, but stumbled as burning pain shot up my leg from my ankle. I slumped against the wall. Oh shit! Paxton! Joseph shouted from above. I fished around the water for the flashlight that was surprisingly still working, although the light was now flickering on and off. Paxton! Joseph called out. I felt a burning sensation on my chest and back. I examined myself with the flashlight and saw broken splints of wood embedded in my skin rivulets of blood dripping out of the wounds. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck, I cried to myself. Hey, you okay? Joseph called out again. <laughs> no, I weakly said. I'll get you out of there. <laughs> Just hold on, man, Joseph shouted as he took off. Hey, wait, I cried out, but he didn't hear me. Of all the times we'd explored abandoned places, we'd never found ourselves in a situation like this. We always made a habit of exploring places inside and out, leaving no stone unturned. I pushed myself up against the wall, shivering from the cold darkness of the submerged basement. I shone my flashlight to check my surroundings. The beam of light could barely penetrate the darkness. The brick walls dripped with a detestable ichor and mold. 
The water continued to ripple in miniature waves from the movements as I tried to get a better look at the basement. Everywhere I looked, I saw black. And that's when I heard something splashing as if something was rising from the water. I saw movement in the darkness. The silhouette of a shape rising from the water caused me to freeze like an animal caught in the headlights of an oncoming vehicle. The realization that I was not alone in the basement took hold. My mind simply refused to process what my eyes were observing. I shone the light at the shape but I could not illuminate the form. It was as if the light was being absorbed by it. Something was very wrong here. I didn't dare to ask who was there. I tried to move, but a jolt of sharp pain shot through my body, and I cried out in agony. As if in response, the shape slowly moved towards me, and a nauseating stench soon overpowered me. It was a stench that I knew all too well. One summer, many years ago when I was a kid, the chain came off my bike when I was riding with some friends. I ended up in a ditch just inches away from the pulpy remains of a dead deer. This was that smell. The smell of death was in the basement here with me now. Joseph, I cried, tears running down my face. The shape was drifting towards me. Soon I heard heavy footfalls upstairs. By this point, my heart felt like it was going to explode. Terror had a death grip on me. Joseph, get me out of here now. There's something down here with me. I continued to plead. And then I saw it. A pale, gaunt face was illuminated by my flickering light. Its eyes were black pupils surrounded by blood-red sclera. The thing instantly closed the gap between us, and it was right in my face. And it let out a scream. And that's when everything went black. When I came to... I found myself in Joseph's truck, and we were speeding down the highway. He brought me to the hospital, and I was treated for my injuries. I even had to take medical leave from work as well. I was unable to concentrate, and I looked terrible. I'd been back to the doctors, but I couldn't tell them about the experience, so I told them that I was under a lot of stress. I spoke to my friend Joseph about that day at the abandoned farmhouse. I told him what I'd seen in the basement. He was as pale as a ghost when I explained it all to him. He nodded his head in agreement. He had seen it too. When he returned with a ladder he got from his truck, he looked down to find me, and for a blip of a nanosecond, he saw that I was in fact not alone down there. It gazed up at him, and then dissolved into the darkness. That's when he saw me black out. I think we were both in a state of shock. What was that thing in the basement? That face has forever been burned into my mind. The image of that thing. And that scream. Was it a roar or a cry? I don't know. I've never been back to that place, and I know that I never will go back. I've given up my exploration hobby, and so has Joseph. I think it's safe to say that we've both been changed since that day. I relive that encounter almost every night in my dreams. Sometimes I get the feeling that I'm being watched by something. Sometimes I think I hear scratching noises coming from inside the walls. But I think that that's just in my mind. I haven't told my parents about this, or my siblings. The only thing they know is that I had an accident exploring an abandoned house. (sighs) 
what would I say to them? Now, my former hobby could be considered dangerous. Besides injuries from structural problems, you could run into animals or dangerous people. <laughs> All that time I never experienced any of these things. Instead, I had an encounter with the unknown. Well, you know what? Haven't done that for quite a while. Quite nice to do it again, isn't it? After all these, I don't know, months, years? Yeah, well, started doing that many, many years ago. Probably three, four years ago? I don't know. And, um, haven't done it for a while, so, uh, glad you could join me. Still awake? If not, doesn't really matter, does it? I can say whatever I want here. Thanks for joining me, and of course I'll be back again very, very soon. Till then, very, very sweet dreams. And bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.